Christy Louthen for inviting me here, and I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy days and evenings to come, especially in the cold weather. Uh, we came down from Boulder, and it was a high of 9 degrees yesterday, so this is a heat wave for us. Um, um, I'm going to share a lot of information with you. I want you to write down your questions. I prefer the question and answer periods because, um, you know, in the last 31 years I've had been given so much information that unless somebody asks the question, it, it sometimes it just doesn't come up. Um, I, there are some real positive aspects to the information and there are some information that is not very positive. There is absolutely nothing that we cannot resolve if we stick together. And what I mean by that is, is that we don't turn on each other. Um, and that is definitely something that they are trying to do, is to divide us. Um, the problems that we have in the world on a government level are just, just a symptom of a much bigger problem. And I believe it was Bill Cooper um, much to his credit, who, who said several years ago, when you put the ETs in the middle of this thing, it all makes sense. And he's absolutely right. Um, I'm going to be presenting to you the Andromedan perspective of what's going on, who we are, and about some of our past history. Now, they have comments about all of our history. Um, and uh, I promise, Pat, that if you ask me the question, I will give you their perspective. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I've been a contactee for 31 years. It hasn't been consistent for 31 years. It has been consistent since 1985. Uh, the first contact was in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in a place called Woodstock. Uh, 1964, I was on a family picnic. I went out to play with, with cousins, and we laid in the grass, and the well, next thing I remember, it's nighttime. Uh, they could not find me. I had missing time. I, don't, I didn't remember anything until uh, age 14. Uh, we went back to the area where I had been sleeping. Uh, my body print was there. My mom, my dad, uh, a, a state trooper, a Michigan state trooper, they had swore up and down. They had looked for me, and I wasn't there. So it was just one of those dilemmas. I got a spanking anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, as far as I was concerned, I was in trouble. Um, it wasn't until age 14 that uh, I had gone to bed. It was in August, just a normal night. And I woke up and I was lying on a bed uh, on a platform. And there were two men standing over me, a very small, short one, and a very tall man. They were both very, very handsome. Um, on a soul level, I had absolute recognition of who they were. And their skin is light blue. Uh, Morinet, who was a very tall uh, gentleman, is more light blue. Thesaeus, who's the shorter one, is much older. Um, his skin was almost white. It had almost lost all of its blue pigmentation. Uh, the Andromedans are a very, very old race. Uh, apparently, all of the human race comes from Lyra. And there's a lot of other information out there. Billy Meyer talks about this as well. It's been confirmed. Um, now, the human race did not originally exist in Lyra. It came from some other galaxy but that's the first place that it evolved here in our galaxy. I want you to be really clear about that. Um, according to uh, the Andromedans, there are over 135 billion human beings in, in the eight galaxies uh, that are closest to us. <clears throat> now, there are also other races out there. Um, some of these races have had a lot of conflicts with the human race. And that conflict continues. But there are things that are happening uh, that hopefully will alleviate that, that problem. And it's not that any one race is more than another. It really comes down to philosophies and things like that. Um, <clears throat> gosh, let me get my notes here. Okay, uh, <laughs> this is the hardest part, getting started. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the Andromedans are a telepathic race. Um, 
Morin A has, over the last 10 years, learned to speak. In other words, exercised his vocal cords. Um, the newsletter that you have in front of you or under you or in your bag, um, the reason it's called Letters from Andromeda is the very first words Morin A said to me uh, when I went on board one particular time was uh, another letter. <coughs> He couldn't say meeting, and apparently he had been trying to learn to say that word, uh, but he couldn't learn it, but letter was easier for him to say, which is why, you know, it's titled in the books will be titled Letters from Andromeda. Um, they, they really care deeply about what's going on, and a lot of it apparently has to do with who we are as souls and who we are genetically and it also has to do with the future. The future that we will probably be in other, light, other physical forms when it occurs. Now, we're talking about the future between now and 357 years from now. Um, now, to us, you know, some may say, well, that doesn't matter, I won't be here. But to other extraterrestrial races, they will be here. Many of them live an average of anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 years. The Andromedan race live to an average of 2,007 years. Now, the years that I'm going to be giving you as far as a measure of time are linear. That's the only way I can give it to you. They do not look at time the same way we do. So um, just, just you know, keep that in mind. Um, they say that our universe and I'm talking about everything that we know about and what we don't know about, is a 21 trillion year old holograph. It's a holograph, that's what they say. Uh, they say that all the matter that is in our universe came out of black holes. And how they've described it is that there was a universe that was evolving. And when they mean evolve, that means that the frequency of that universe continued to evolve. And what happened was, I'll try to make this as dark as possible, guys, for you. Would it prefer to be red? Okay, okay. Um, as, this, as this universe evolved, those energies or series of matter, pieces of matter, which include consciousness, that did not want to evolve because they were holding themselves back, they were full of fear, whatever their frequency was, started to gain weight. They got heavy. And what happened was they form sacks of matter. And as it gets heavier, these sacks continue to fill and get heavier. So what happens, apparently, is as this raises in frequency, and I'm talking about color and sound, they say that everything in our universe is made up of color and sound. These areas, these pockets of resistance that have gained weight at some point break and explode out like this. They say that the Big Bang Theory is correct in its simplicity, but under every galaxy, apparently, there is a black hole, which is where everything came out of. So everything in our universe, all the matter in our universe came from someplace else. That includes us as well. They say, the Andromedans say, that there is no age to us. So you can take that any way you want. But there's no age to us that we truly are infinite. Now, this scenario is apparently what's beginning to happen now in our universe, 21 trillion years later. It's beginning to happen all over again. What's happening now is that according to 
uh, Visayas and Mornay, on March 23rd of 1994, a color and sound frequency started emanating from all the black holes in the known universe. Now in their science, and as far as they can go back in time and check, this is the first time anything's ever come out of a black hole. And what this, this energy, this frequency is doing, it is creating a holographic impression over all of the dimensional levels in our known universe now, of which they say there are 11 creational densities. 11. This holograph is now a 12. <coughs> Now they say that it has one frequency, it does not carry a duality. And what it's doing, it is literally pulling all the dimensions up. Now, this is the most controversial part. They say that by December of 2013, third density as we know it, as we know ourselves here, will cease to exist. It is imploding on itself because everything is being drawn up. Everything. Those on the 11th are going to 12. 9 to 10, etc., etc. We are supposed to go to 4th and then to 5th, like this. Now, in the Andromedan perspective, 4th density is a consciousness. It is where an entire race is telepathic with each other, they are aware of each other, they feel each other, they know each other, they are one mind. Separate, but still one. Fifth density is where we're light. We literally are, what we would consider on this density, light. They say this is going to happen no later than 2013 based on their science. Now, do I know if it's right? I will know when you know. Okay? Uh, but they haven't been wrong yet, with the exception of one thing, and that was about Bill Clinton. <coughs> but we were all wrong about Bill Clinton. <laughs> um, Okay, so what's happening now? This frequency, there are individual consciousnesses that have appeared in this density, this 12th density, this holograph. And apparently they're like nothing that's ever been seen before. They don't know who they are, what they are, or even how to describe them. But apparently they have the ability, these beings up here, to look straight down and see everything that's going on. They can look right through dimensions. That's all I know about that. Now, why is this happening? Um, excuse me, let me regress here for a second. Now, while this is happening, what's happening again is sacs are forming. People are starting to gain weight. Essences, spirits, consciousness are starting to gain weight. That's because the frequency is pulling everything up. Now, what's happening is that those energies that are regressive, and that's the best word I can use, I don't want to say negative or dark, I will say regressive, they are starting to freak out, big time. Now, according to the Andromedans, every single one of us on this planet Earth, and in 21 other star systems, okay, so we have Earth, and 21 other systems in our galaxy. I'm not talking the universe, I'm talking about our galaxy. Are apparently a group of beings, individual consciousnesses, that apparently had evolved some trillions of years ago to the 11th density. And then somebody came up with a brilliant idea to drop down, to fall into the concept of time and experiment with our thoughts creating physical matter. So apparently they say that a large group of us dropped down into third density. There's a lot of this I don't understand. But what happened was, when we got to here, we found a particular race, or races, that had a very specific genetic coding. Now, I, I, I know extensively about Earth, so that's all I'm going to deal with. 
is, is those of us on Earth. Apparently, what happened was Earth is at the very tail end of our galaxy. And it's along a trade route that leaves our galaxy that goes to Andromeda Galaxy, it goes to Thares, which is another one that's, that's away from us, uh, that apparently is visited very frequently. And what happened was we found a race that had a genetic coding of 22 different extraterrestrial races. <clears throat> now, all life on this planet was brought here by traders. We're talking about extraterrestrial traders now. Explorers, miners, uh, just those out for a joy ride. Um, there are all different scenarios, but all life was brought here. And originally, apparently, our Earth was in a different orbit. It was closer to Mars, and it was nothing but ice then. Now, what happened was the Alpha Draconans, which are a reptilian race, they are the reptilian race. And we're gonna we're gonna get to that as far as as far as the hierarchy. This reptilian race are master geneticists. They just create life. They tinker with life, um, and all of these life forms, in their perspective, are a natural resource. Now this is important. Okay? They look at these life forms that they've created, that they've altered, as a natural resource. Does everybody follow that? Okay. Now, apparently, they brought the primate race. They created the primate race. And it first was on Mars, and then it was brought to Earth. And this is the primate race. Now, the primate race was then tinkered with by many other different races, 21 other races, which brings it to the 22 different extraterrestrial races. Now, I know there's a lot, a lot of other conflicting information out there. Some say it was 9, some say it was 12, some say it was 11. I don't know. I'm just here to offer this, their perspective. Out of these 22 races that tinkered with, with this primate race, it eventually became Homo sapiens sapien, which is who we are on a physical level. Yes, we did used, we did used to have 12 strands of DNA. Yes. Ten were taken out. Those ten apparently were taken out by a group from Orion. And the reason they were taken out, it was to control us and to hold us back. Now, why would they want to hold us back? The reason they wanted to hold us back is because of this. Somehow, some way, they found out who we were on a soul level. According to the Andromedans, we are a group of energies that they know of as the Patal. And the reason they use this word, and this is, by the way, a draconian word, is because of legends that the draconians themselves have about warring with a, group, with a race that was creating form, human form, life forms that were opposed to their philosophy. Now, the Patal apparently were creating life forms so that they could evolve on their own. Free expression, free expression, free expression. The Draconians, on the other hand, created another race, were creating races as, to be a natural resource for their pleasure. So you have two very different philosophies here. Well, how they found out who we were, apparently, was our extremes and emotions. We are very, very different than all the other races. Very different. Even the Andromedans do not understand how we could hate one minute and then five minutes later be forgiving and loving and snuggly and cuddly. They don't understand it. On one trip on board one of the craft, I was more and they came to get me. I was brought back. Viseus was there, and he was watching a television. Well, it would look like a television. It was sitting in the middle of the room. <clears throat> when I walked in, there was a room just floating, uh, a screen just floating in the middle of the room. 
and he was standing there watching it. And he was watching a news broadcast of something that was going on in Chicago, where a policeman was, had shot a black man and then had run up behind him and then tried to save his life. And Faseus just didn't have a clue why the policeman would try to take his life and then immediately rush to his aid and try to save him. And I couldn't explain it to him. I, I you know, I, because I don't understand. I really don't know. I mean, so, you know, they're perplexed how we could be, we could be this incredible race and have the abilities that we have and be so hell-bent on destroying ourselves. They don't have a clue. You know, and, and ever after, after having been with them for so long, e even my perspective has changed a lot in that respect. You know, none of it makes sense to me anymore. Um, another time I was, came on board and Morinet was looking out of a window at the earth and he had all these meters and he was looking at the atmosphere of the earth and I said, well, what is the matter? He looked very sad. And he said, don't they understand that all of this is here because they needed it? They don't understand how we can just destroy our environment. They, they just don't understand. <clears throat> it's not like we have another place to go. We don't. You know, there's no Greyhound to Mars or, well, there is, but we can't ride on it. <laughs> All right. I'm skipping around a little bit because I just I don't really know where to go with this. Uh, we have the ability, each one of us, even though we may not feel like it, on a spiritual level, on a on a on an energy level. We can time travel, we can go forward in time, we can go backwards in time, we can literally create anything without technology. And the reason we can do that is because of our mind, because of who we are. It's because of our extremes of emotions. And according to the Andromedans, the male energy, the male portion of ourselves is the idea. It brings the thought in. It is the feminine part, the emotional part of us that literally pulls it to us, that makes it manifest in physicality. Now, Pat and I were talking earlier, and um, a third density is, is incredibly dense. A lot of extraterrestrial races don't like to hang out here because it's so dense. And the best example I can give you is that if you were to take your hand and run it through a puddle of water or a, a bathtub full of water like this, you would have some resistance, but you could move it through, okay? You can move your hand through the water. They view third density as that same bathtub, but full of jello. You put your hand in that jello and you try to go from one side to the other, there's a lot of resistance. That's how they view third density. And they say that proof of how awesome we really are is because of the fact that we can literally create this third density. As slow as it is, as dense as it is, as it is, our intent can literally create anything here. They can't do that without technology. They can't do it without technology. This world that we live on, according to Viseas and Morinet, each one of us helped to create. It literally is us. And we are it. We're one. We literally are one. We created this place. And they don't understand why we want to destroy it. Now, the hierarchy. There are two schools of thought, and I'm just going to deal with the galaxy, in our galaxy. There are the regressives, okay, and I'm going to try not to repeat myself, but the regressives are races that just, just carry fear. 
they carry fear, which is why they want to control. Um, the hierarchy of this race is a group from Alpha Draconis. According to the Andromedans, they have no idea where this race came from. Their teachings, their history, and what they've learned from other dimensional races is that somebody brought the Draconans to this universe and dumped them here. And they took them to Alpha Draconis because this was the place they had the highest chances of survival, the highest probability of survival. And according to the Andromedans, the Alpha Draconans have had space travel for four billion years. They're an incredible race. They're an incredible race. They've achieved great things. But they're bullies. They're jerks. And that's a judgment, and I'm taking that judgment myself. That's my judgment, based on what I know about them. They don't like human beings. In their history, in their teachings, the Andromedans say that they were taught that this universe was here for them, that they were left here and told it was theirs to rule. But when they started traveling, they ran across other races. And they were able to conquer many of those races. And how they've conquered those races was through genetic altering. Now, our government, the United States government, the world government, the New World Order, whatever you want to call it, wants to implant everybody. In the Andromedan perspective, that means ownership. Extraterrestrials, they can't be bothered with that stuff. That's, those are toys. That's not permanent. You can always lose the hand. It can always burn out. You can always die. Okay? But in extraterrestrials, they don't value gold or silver, they value genetics. So what they do is they will come in, conquer a race, and genetically alter it. And from that moment on, that race is genetically altered. And it is the genetics that they put inside these races that alters their frequency, their sound, their thought, everything about them. Everything about them is then altered if they move into a physical form. Does everybody follow that? <laughs> Does, hello? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> no? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, gosh, I don't even know how to give you an example. Um, the best example I can give you are the greys. Apparently the greys were much more human looking at one time. Uh, what happened was they, as a race, were captured approximately 893,000 years ago, leaving Zeta-1, Zeta-2 to go off on their own and do their own thing. This is very common amongst other races, that they do this. This is how Earth got colonized by many different races. They were just out there exploring. Well, what happened was they got captured by a group in Orion that was already under the control and genetic manipulations of the Alpha Draconans. The Orions captured the Greys. According to Mornay, the first thing they did was they slaughtered almost all of the women. Now, the reason they do that is to control the birth process. And what they did was they started to genetically alter the women, the females of that race, so that all the children born after that were genetically altered. Does everybody understand that? They were different in some way than they were before. The men were enslaved, and they were made to work mines. They were made to do all kinds of different things. They were slaughtered absolutely no regard for life. They were a natural resource. The greys themselves became a natural resource. Now, the greys, I'm told, would absolutely love to be free of this hierarchy. 
But what they've done is they've continued to propagate the problem. Now, we've been told that they've been here for thousands of years. According to the Andromedans, that's a lie. They got here in 1931. But because of their ability to time travel, it looks like they've been here thousands of years because they can go backwards in time. And by going backwards in time, you can literally alter the consciousness of any race. You can alter any event. And that's exactly what they've done. Now, they're not the only ones who have done this. There's a group from Cirrus B that have also been tinkering with this. Now, it took me a long time to really understand why it is they wanted to do this. And the bottom line is, it was to control us. We have things that they want. Okay, we have the benefit of apparently being on 11th density. That means that we've covered a, a very large area of growth, of spiritual growth, of evolvement, which is why our extreme of emotions is so big. They want that information. Not only that, but now, with the new frequency that's coming in, and third density beginning to implode on itself, the greys are, in fact, trying to save their race. According to Mornay, there are really only 2,000 real greys left. Everything else are clones. They're robots. That's all. They're organic robots. They're not, they do not carry a life force, an essence, a spiritualness about them. They're robots. And folks, we're talking about technology thousands of years ahead of where we are now. Just thousands of years. Now, the reason the greys are doing so many abductions is one for genetics. Okay, they're trying to bring their two races together. Okay, this information is correct. The other reason is, is that during an abduction, stick person, okay, we all know what the energy field is, the aura. Does everybody know what the aura is? It's around everything that's, that is alive. What they're doing is, once they've created a hybrid, the problem they're having is they can't keep it alive. And the reason they can't keep it alive is because spirit will not attach to it. The life force will not attach to it. So what they're doing is they're abducting the mothers, and according to the Andromedans, most of the hybrids are female, by the way. There are very few males. They're mostly female. Because that's how you propagate the race. And in our ancient history, you know, the royal line of a family was charted through the mother, not the father. Because you always know who the mother is. You don't always know who the father is. Well, what they're doing is they're peeling the vital body of the mothers, the children, which are mostly females, They're containing it. They have the ability to contain this life force. And then what they're doing is they're feeding it to the hybrids. They're feeding the vital life force of the children and the mothers to the hybrid of the same lineage. Okay, they take an egg from the mother, they create a hybrid. They come back and they take the vital bodies of the mother and the female children and they continue to feed it because they're trying to create soul. Does everybody follow that? They're trying to create a soul, and they just can't do it. So they're desperate, which is why there's just so many weird things happening. I mean, that's just one of the things. You know, there's no black and white to this. This is a huge, complex, gray conspiracy within a conspiracy within a conspiracy. It's just bizarre stuff. And why we agreed to do this, I have no clue. So what's happening is this is not working. So the races are dying. Now, <laughs> what the greys have actually done, because they're having problems here, is they have been abducting children, and many of the children are, like, not here anymore. This is why children are disappearing all over the world. They are vanishing without a trace. Some of them, 
Some of them are being taken by the Grays. Westchester County, New York, the last three years, 5,000 children have vanished without a trace. Without a trace. The government knows what's going on, but they're harmless. To, they're, they can't do any, they're helpless to do anything about it. And the reason they don't want to bring it up is because they let the bastards in here in the first place. They cut a deal. They cut a deal. They sold us out. And I got a lot of energy on it. Because I have friends who want to know where their kids are. Now, <clears throat> this is just one scenario. Apparently we've been manipulated for 5,724 years now. We have been manipulated. Beyond belief, we've been manipulated. Um, to make matters worse, we've had technology, free energy technology, that has been withheld from us. So in the last hundred years, we have totally trashed our environment. Now, There's so much. I'm glad we have three hours. <laughs> um, okay, we'll look at the positives. There are so many that really want to help. But if those of you who are Trekkies, you know the number one rule. You do not intervene with an evolving race unless you're asked. That happens to be a reality. They will not directly intervene, or they're not supposed to, unless they are specifically asked. Now those people who are contactees, they have a lineage, a reincarnational lineage that leads back to many of these positive races, which is why it is not considered intervention. Does everybody follow? Now, in our galaxy, there are many different councils, and I don't know everything about all those other councils. But I do know about the Andromedan Council. And the Andromedan Council is a group of beings from 139 different races, star systems, that come together and discuss what's going on. It's like a galactic United Nations, except it's not a political body. They literally get together and they discuss what's going on. Now, what they've really recently been discussing has been the tyranny that's in our future, 350 years from now, because that affects everybody. So apparently what they have done through time travel is they've been able to figure out where the significant shift in energy occurred that causes the tyranny 357 years into our future. And they've traced it back to our solar system. And in our solar system, they've been able to break it down and they've traced it back to Earth the moon and Mars, those three places. Okay? Now, the very first meeting the Andromedan Council had was to whether or not to directly intervene with what was going on here. Now, I, according to Moore there were only 78 uh, systems that met for the first time. Of the 78, just short of half decided they wanted nothing to do with us at all, regardless of the problems we had and the intervention. And I think it's really important that you know why they did this. Now, we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, star systems that are hundreds of millions of light years away from us. Even some who have never even met us, have never met any of you, but they just know the vibration of the planet because the vibration of the planet is a reflection of the vibration of the beings on it. These were their reasons for not wanting to do anything to help us. Number one, they don't respect themselves, they don't respect each other, and they don't respect their home. What is their value? Now they're talking about us. Are 
I was pretty depressed. Fortunately, a better portion of 50% thought that because of we, we have been manipulated for 5,724 years, that we deserved an opportunity to at least prove ourselves. To at least have a shot at proving the less than 50% right. So, the Andromedan Council has passed a directive. I don't know how they're going to carry it out, but they have ordered all extraterrestrial presences, whether they're benevolent or not, off our planet no later than August 12, 2003. They want everything that's ET in the planet, on the planet, on the moon, out of here. And the reason is they want to see how we're going to react and act with each other when we're not being manipulated. And folks, you are being manipulated. We are all being manipulated. And my first suggestion to you, if you want to do something about it, is to throw your televisions away. And I, I can't tell you how sincere I am about that. Because they're teaching you what to think and not how to think. And the minute you give that up, you become a robot. You, became, you become sheeple. We become sheeple. And I, I, I know it's going to be tough. It's going to be really hard. Now, <clears throat> this is going to be very interesting, and I'll tell you why. Inside our planets, living 100 to 200 miles beneath our surface, are 1,837 reptilians. This number has gone up. They've been here apparently a very, very long time. There are 17 human beings from Sirius B living inside the planet. There are 18,000 gray clones living inside the Earth and on our moon. The real grays, the 2,000 that are left, most of them are living on Phobos, the moon of Mars, which is an artificial satellite, in case you didn't know. Okay? It's an artificial satellite. There are approximately 141 Orion group beings here who are made up of nine different races. Okay, so we got a lot of bad boys here that have technology thousands and thousands and thousands of years ahead of us. It is estimated that the greys themselves have technology now, we're, you know, we're talking about clones. Most of them are clones who are being controlled. They have no essence. They have virtually no emotions, all right, that have technology 2.5 thousand years ahead of us. Well, that's a scary thought. Then you've got the Orions who control the greys who are approximately 3.7 thousand years ahead. Nobody really knows exactly how far the Draconans are because they're incredibly elusive. Syrians, group, uh, the Syrians are apparently 932 years ahead of us. Now, how many of you have heard of the Montauk technology? Okay, it's time travel, opening up, like Stargate, opening up time warps. Apparently, that technology was given to us, by or to our government, by this group from Cirrus B. Apparently, we were, not, we were not supposed to have it, and it was supposed to be another 150 years before we would have developed this technology ourselves. So what they did was they purposely gave us this technology knowing we would abuse it. Knowing it. Now, I cannot tell you what the mindset was of those Terrans, those of us who were here, that got this technology and started doing all of this weird stuff with it. But I can tell you that within the last six weeks, Moranay has told me that they have found 
a small human colony on a planet in a star system, in a solar system, in Altar. Altar, it's a, it's a constellation called Altar. They have found a human population there from Earth that has children with it. It's a military, and they have enslaved the beings of that planet. Now, Montauk only works if you have exact coordinates. That means somebody gave them those coordinates. And they are really upset about what's happened with that. That's just one of the problems. And the other problem that's evolved from this, and we'll take a short break here in a minute, involves the human extraterrestrial races that are benevolent. Now, many of the races are really pure. In other words, the Pleiadians mate with Pleiadians. Cirrus A mates with Cirrus A, the individual races. Well, apparently what's happened is that there's been so much interbreeding amongst these particular races, these human races, that they are now beginning to anticipate breakdowns in the genetic coding. The Pleiadians apparently are going to start experiencing this in the next 172 linear Earth years, where they're actually, for the first time in, in thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, going to see deformities at birth. The Andromedans anticipate this problem themselves in 757 years. I don't know about the Cirrus A's. Now, there's only one race that can help give them a genetic boost so that this, does, this breakdown does not occur. They say it's us. It's our genetics. And they would want to make a proposal to borrow some of our genetics to help them, but they can't. One, they can't come near us now because of our vibration. Two, they can't use our genetics because of the vibration that it carries of fear. That's not an emotion they know. The first time I went on a, an, an Andromedan mothership, and I've been meeting with Viseas and Morning for almost two and a half years before they actually took me to one of their huge motherships, the first time I walked onto it, there were a bunch of children there. And the minute they saw me, they started to run away. And it wasn't me, but they knew that I was from Earth. We have a very bad reputation. Because we are only, we are the only race in our galaxy. I'm going to say this really carefully. We are the only race in our galaxy that kills itself, that kills each other, that turns on itself. We're the only ones. We are the only race that allows its race to live in abject poverty. We are the only ones that allow members of our race to starve. We are the only ones to allow our race to be homeless. And we are the only race that would sell their own race into slavery. They have a serious problem with that. Oh. Now, I, I know this is hard. You know, Some of you may think, ah, oh, this is just absolute disbelief. Well, I, I, I want you to know something. Your chair does not have a seatbelt. You can get up and leave any time you want. In fact, I would insist that you exercise your free will to do that. And I mean that. We don't, I don't, you know, uh, this, is, this is the part I don't like. You know, I don't like the reflection that they give me about us. I mean, I have enough trouble, you know, with our own day-to-day -day life, making sure the cars work and all, paying the phone bill and all this other stuff. You know, and it's not that they're judging, they just don't understand why we do it. You know, and if anybody's got an answer for it, you know, I'm open. Yes, we've been manipulated with belief systems, but why do we believe these belief systems? Let's 
take a break. I need a break. We have lift off. Okay. <laughs> um, just before the break, I said something to you. Now, I've asked a lot of questions about, about Earth and about religions and about our history. And one of the things that, you know, Morinae has this really great way of, of mirroring back my questions in the form of a question. Um, and one of the things that he mirrored back to me was, um, it was a, a question regarding a, a particular history of religion. And his response to that was, it is not so much what you believe in, but more so why you believe it. I understand somebody told me today there's a book published about that. Recently somebody wrote a book. And, um, you know, I've had to look at that, and I've had to go back and look at all the belief systems that I have and why I have them. Are they really mine, or is it something that I've been fed that I believe is true, and I am basing my perceptions based on the idea that maybe they are true or maybe they're not true? Um, you know, that's, that's something that each one of you need to do individually. Another time, uh, I was feeling really bummed. Um, there were a lot of things going on in my personal life that just weren't that great. In fact, they were they stunk. And um, I was I was really down, and uh, I had had a contact, and I didn't want to come back here. I just flat did not want to come back, <coughs> and I was very upset. Um, but I was made to come back. And uh, as I'm walking away, Viseus, I heard Viseus' voice in my head, who's the other Andromedan. And I turned around and Viseus looked at me and he said, Alex, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry, lifetime after lifetime. And folks, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about that. That I don't look at every decision I make um, and, and try to get really crystal clear as to why I'm making that decision. And where is that decision coming from inside of me? Uh, another time, uh, I was talking with Morinay, and Morinay just turned to me, and he totally caught me off guard. And he said, Alex, when you're having a relationship with yourself, where does the love come from? He said, when you're having a relationship with your family, where does that love come from? And he said, when you're having an affair, a relationship with the universe, where does that love come from? And, you know, the obvious answer is, well, it comes from me. That's exactly what I said to him. And he turned away, and he stopped, and he looked back, and he said, well, then why do, you, why do you believe that you have a shortage of love in your life? And again, it all goes back to belief systems. If they're right, we created all of this to watch how our thoughts can create matter. So, in essence, everything is a belief system. If the universe, now we call it a universe, the Andromedans call our universe consciousness. Okay? Now they say that consciousness is the space that you create in which to evolve. So in other words, to continue to evolve or to do what we needed to do, we had to create the space in order to do it. And that is physicality. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on every dimension, whether it's third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way up to twelfth, there is a physicality on each one of those dimensions. Okay, fifth density is not where they're just whispering like Okay, it is not like that. There is a genuine physicality to it. It's a lot different than what we have here, what we've created here. But nonetheless, it is a physicality. 
and it's the same for sixth and seventh as I'm told. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get back to this hierarchy for a minute because I wanted to show you what was in our past and what it is today. All right, I wanted to show you the similarities so that you would see that number one, history does repeat itself until we decide to break cycle. And two, it's always been the same. If you go back and look at history, if you look at Egypt, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, and you look at the Greeks, the mythology, okay, there is, there is elements of truth in all of that. Now in the ancient days you had the gods, okay? The gods, we know about the gods. Mythology is littered with stories about the gods. Warring with, you, with each other, uh, the gods of man marrying the, do uh, the sons of God marrying the daughters of man. And all through literature, ancient literature, there's stories of this. Then the gods would allow a select few, usually their offspring, who were kings or pharaohs, to rule in their place as they went scuttering about the galaxy. Bless you. Now the kings didn't want to do much, didn't want really much to have to do with the common people, so they had their priesthoods that would control information. They would control information. They would control the masses. They would accumulate wealth. The priesthoods make sure, were sh made sure that the military kept the common people in order, or the masses. Okay, whatever the dictates were, this group here made sure that it happened. That's the way it's been in all through our ancient history. Okay, if you read Zachariah Sitchin's information, many other people, I understand there's an awesome book called uh, oh, The Greatest Story Never Told by Lana Cantrell. It's out of print, but if you can find it, Jordan Maxwell was telling me about it. Um, the Gods of Eden by William Bramley. These are excellent, excellent books that are very well documented. Now, if you look at today, okay, we still have basically the same situation. The ETs are still here. Names and faces change, but they have the same mindset. Control, control, control. Okay, your pharaohs, what do you have? You have prime ministers. I'll just abbreviate. You have presidents. And in some countries, you still have actually a king. Priesthoods. Well, we do have religions. Okay. We also have bankers. Okay, we have bankers. Those of you who have done, done any research on Nazi Germany, there's a lot, there's a wealth of information regarding secret societies and the power that these societies have because of money and how every, virtually every country on the planet is bankrupt and how a small group of men who represent a priesthood, secret societies, control everything. They are doing the bidding, I want you to be really clear on this, they are apparently doing the bidding of these guys. Because the whole point of all of this coming down on our planet is to take away from us self-rule, self-rule, and free will. Let's make things so bad on this planet that the masses are begging to be saved. And then let's, let's have somebody come in and save them. And according to the Andromedans, if you do not accept self-responsibility and you allow somebody to come in and save you, you do not permanently evolve. And I'm not here to buck anybody else's belief systems. I'm just sharing with you what they've said. Sir, do you need some water? <coughs> okay, then you've got the military. Sorry for the handwriting, I'm getting a little loose here. Military, 
You know, and what do you've got? You've got nuclear weapons. You've got technology that is absolutely far beyond anything we know. Okay? Mutually assured destruction. <laughs> it's an interesting concept. <clears throat> you make one move and I'll blow you away. But at the same time, I'll blow myself away. All right? So we have, we have 100,000 100, of these things all over the world. And then you have the masses. So as you can see, it's really just, it's very much the same. Nothing's really changed. Except now, we have ways to destroy ourselves. Where here, we didn't have to. The gods were more than happy to do that. Okay? They could control pole shifts. They could move our planet's orbit. I mean, this technology exists. The Draconans can literally create a solar system using their starships. They can move planets. They can take moons, put them in orbits of planets. They can find a star. They can put things in the orbits around the star. They can literally create solar systems. Okay, there are races that have this technology. The Andromedans have said that about that around 2003, if all of the regressives are not out of here, that the first line of defense that they have is our moon. That they have every intention, and again, this is their perspective, they have every intention of taking our moon with a tractor beam and pulling it out of here, out of our orbit, and dealing with it out there. Because if they deal with it too close to us, it could in fact destroy the Earth, or at least cause a polar shift which would destroy all life and nobody would have gained anything. We would have been the big loser. Now what would happen if they did that? I asked that exact question. He said, well, you would have no tides. And he said, if you were really upset, we could always give you another one. It's really that simple to them. It's not to us, but that's their perspective. So we need to look at things as not permanent. We need to open up our perspectives to the idea that there is a lot more going on and there's a lot more we need to learn. Not only about the world or about our solar system, but about ourselves. Now the Andromedans say that there are a hundred trillion galaxies in the known universe. A hundred trillion. a lot of zeros. You know, another 30 years, that'll be our national debt. <laughs> That's really not a laughing matter. Uh, uh. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to get to the slides. I want to talk about the moon and Mars. <clears throat> um... Our moon, according to the Andromedans, is an artificial satellite. It absolutely positively is. Um, I will tell you this quite honestly. There are a lot of people doing some great work. Two years ago, I sat in a hotel room with Richard Hoagland, and I said, Richard, why don't you just tell people that the moon's an artificial satellite? His response was, I'm not ready. So he knows. Why he's withholding, I don't know. He's doing great work, but I'm telling you he's withholding. And I'm telling you from my own personal experience. Okay, I'm not withholding. You know, if they have a problem with it, it's their problem. According to the Andromedans, our moon came from a star system in, from Ursa Minor called Chauta. It was one of four moons in a solar system that had 21 planets, and our moon came out of orbit of the 17th planet in that 21-planet system. It was brought here with others uh, during a war. Our moon's first location in orbit in our solar system was around a planet called Moldek, which is now the asteroid belt. Our moon had survivors on it. It had apparently nine huge domed cities on it. Nine. Key word here, nine. It had water, had plant life, it had a lot of different things on it. Even had huge caverns underneath that can 
continue to sustain life and do today as we speak. Okay? Except now there are a lot of human beings on the, on the moon, and we're going to talk about that. Now, what happened was, apparently, our moon, when it was in the orbit of Maldek, had two moons. One is the moon that we know of, called Lunar. This one here is what we know as Phobos. Both of these moons were around Moldek. One group went to Mars. Our moon, which apparently its, its ability to travel was disabled. I don't know the whole story on that. And what happened was the beings that were on it are what we know as the Aryans, the white race. Does everybody follow me so far? The Pleiadians apparently helped get this, this vehicle, which we know is our moon, operational, and they came into orbit, which is now our Earth. So the beings that came here on our moon were Maldekians. Everybody follow that. Moldekians are one of the lost tribes of Hyra. That is who's living underground underneath Tibet. That is who's living underground under Tibet. They're Moldekians. Uh, basically, they pretty much stay to themselves. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. That's kind of where it is. They have nowhere else to go. There's enough bad guys here to, you know, but they're basically just doing nothing. Now, all you got to do is research the Tibetan information, and, uh, you know, they admit through their ancient liter lit lit literature about who's underneath there. Now, Our moon now is colonized. I am told by Mornay that there is a working population, a full-time working population on our moon of 35,000 people. And they are all Aryans by birth. I'll let you figure that out yourself. There are no blacks, Hispanics, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Italians, they're all Aryans by birth. Now, in our hist in, in our, the UFO literature that's going out, uh, we are told that there are a lot of different groups. Um, this is the part that makes me the most nervous. According to Morinet, now this is the Andromedan perspective, Inside what we call the National Security Agency is a group called the Black Monks. These are human beings, but they completely interact with all the ETs. Morinet has said that these beings here are so implanted in extraterrestrial belief systems that they are no longer considered Terrans or humans. Just, they're just not one of us anymore. <clears throat> and underneath this group, there is what is called Blue Moon. Now, I understand that this changes all the time. But this group here primarily deals with the lunar bases. Now, this is not just U.S., okay? This is Russian, British, French, beings, human beings, from these different countries here. Okay? Now, what you've got above that are bankers. Okay? All they needed to, all they had to do to create this stuff was they needed the money. And those of you who have researched the Federal Reserve, you know how easy it is to create money if you're them, not if you're us. <clears throat> okay? This group here 
deals specifically with the lunar bases, requisition and whatever else is needed. Development of technology, especially that which is going on in the Manzano Mountains by the Department of Energy, the things that they're building for the moon, to be used on the moon. Now, underneath that, there is a group called Alpha-1 and Alpha-2. I'm not real clear so much about what Alpha-1 does. My understanding is, is that these people here, whoever they are, and this we're talking about something global now, okay, this is a globe, this is part of the global government, that Alpha-1 has to do with materials. Gathering the materials, making sure that the herd, as, as Pat likes to say, that the herd doesn't get spooked. That's us. We're the herd. Okay? Alpha 2 deals with personnel. It was their job to make sure that the 35,000 that went to the moon were the kind of people they wanted, had the belief system they wanted. Okay? Their job also was to make sure that the colonists that went to Mars were the kind of people that they wanted, even if they didn't want to go. According to Morinet, Alpha 2 is MJ-12. <clears throat> so what we think is the top of the ladder is actually the bottom of the ladder. That's what he says. I have no way to verify this. But I'm just I'm sharing it nonetheless. Okay. Mars. Our moon does have an atmosphere. There's a lot of really weird things about it, and we'll talk about it when I show the slides. Uh, a couple things about Mars I want to share with you, and that is that according to the Andromedans, Mars is three times the size they tell us it is. We are told in literature that it's 4,200 miles circumference. According to the Andromedans, it's 11,421 miles. It's three sides of what they tell us it is. In diameter, I'm sorry, diameter. Um, this past March of 1995, in the San Diego newspaper, and I had this and somebody stole it from me, um, in the local San Diego newspaper, it, it, it published a report, it had a picture of Mars during the spring, you know, because it was at its closest point. It was a Hubble telescope photograph, really nice picture. It said that in 1971, the Viking uh, orbiter discovered huge amounts of ozone in the Martian atmosphere. Now, how many books do you know of that have told you that, that there is ozone in the Martian atmosphere? Zero. Zero is a controlled leak. Two, we're told that it's primarily, the atmosphere is primarily carbon dioxide. Well, how did Mars get the gas of carbon dioxide when it's supposedly totally devoid of plant life? And always has been. How? You go back to the books. When they see the polar cap the pole cap of Mars melt during the spring when it's at its closest point towards the sun. How is it that the history books or the science books tells us that the highest temperature Mars gets is 141 degrees below zero and that the polar cap of Mars is in fact H2O, it's water. Now somebody please tell me, because I don't get this, how does water melt at 141 degrees below zero? I'm open. I, I'm open to the answer. According to the Andromedans, the average temperature around the equator of Mars is 59 degrees. I haven't been there, but that's what they say. Um, in 1979, NASA admitted seeing clouds going over Olympus Mons, allegedly the largest volcano in our solar system. Olympus Mons is 72,000 feet. Folks, that's a hell of an atmosphere if you've got clouds going over a mountain at 72,000 feet. That's an awesome atmosphere. It's nothing like what we've been told. So I'm going to say this for the record, and I'll probably get in trouble. They're full of shit. 
Uh, the monuments on Mars and, and things like that, the face on Mars, according to Morinet, that is a tomb. And uh, I'm going to show you where they've had me look in another direction. Um, now that's in the northern hemisphere. I'm going to show you the southern hemisphere. There are apparently many monuments like that all over the surface. Now, they've also said that in our solar system, if you look at all the planets, and some of them we can't see the surface yet, but at 19.5 degrees, and I know Richard talks about this, Richard Hoagland, 19 degrees north and 19.5 degrees south, there are monuments on every single one of the planets in our solar system. And the reason for them being there is that it, it causes a frequency, a magnetic frequency of these planets which aligns them all together. And what it does is it apparently causes um, a sound. It creates a sound. Now we're talking about even on Jupiter. It creates a sound. Now what this sound does, what this frequency does, is it polarizes our solar system. It just so happens, according to Morinet, that this polarized sound is in direct reflection, opposition to who we are as spiritual beings. In other words, we vibrate at a specific frequency. As long as these planets, our solar system, vibrates at this frequency, on a soul level, we can't leave. We're stuck. I don't understand all of it. And I even hesitate to bring it up because I don't, because I don't understand all of it. But I'm sharing with you what, I, what little I do understand. Uh, Venus, the planet Venus, used to be one of the moons of Uranus. It was moved. Mercury, apparently, used to be one of the, one of the moons of Saturn. It was also moved. What the big plan is, what the big design was, why they did it, I don't know. Uh, when I asked about the Earth, they had mentioned that the Earth was in a different orbit, that it was ice. When I asked who moved it, Morinet's response was, that's something the Pleiadians will have to answer. And that's the only answer he gave me. Now, the peas aren't bad, but they're not telling everything either. You know, they've been involved in our solar system for a long, long time. And they've made incredible strides, you know, and I think, and, and I was told the only reason that the Andromedans themselves and the Council is even involved in this is because the Pleiadians went to them. Because the Pleiadians took it upon themselves that what happened was our solar system went through a war, was involved in a skirmish, a war, 117,000 years ago. And part of it was caused by the Pleiadians. Well, what happened was they just kind of like hightailed out of here. And then some of them came back during Atlantis, and folks, Atlantis was an extraterrestrial colonization. It was not you and I, it was not Homo sapiens sapiens as we know ourselves. They were ETs, literally ETs. And they devastated this planet in a war, and they just hightailed it out of here. They didn't take responsibility for what they did. They just split. And now, they're having to come back and try to fix it. But the problem is, when they came back, their past hit them square in the face. We are a reflection of who they used to be. And they're having a real hard time dealing with it. Because in order to fix this problem, they have to step back into the warrior space. And they don't want to do that, because it's so destructive. So they're having to get some help. See what else. Okay, let's just let's go to the slides. <clears throat> okay, I think we're all set here. I think we just need to turn off the lights and we can get started on this. Um, they have a camera that and I'll use myself as an example, they, can, they will take a picture of me. Now they have a way of taking the film and separating it. 
And the picture that they take of me right this minute. Here we go, here we go. Okay, the picture that they take of me now is myself now all the way back to conception. Now, let's say I have, I had a liver problem. They could take this camera and separate it and they can go back to the time where my body, my liver, was the strongest, it vibrated at the highest degree of frequency, it was at its most healest, healing, and healthiest point. What they do is they take that frequency, which is me now, they overlap it and they project it holographically over my diseased liver. And within minutes, my liver's healed. Now they do this with holographs, with holographic technology. And it literally is me healing myself with the help of this camera. Okay? We have the same capabilities if we use our mind. The key here is to open it up to the idea of everything that we record in our mind is in fact recorded holographically. Every single thought you have is recorded holographically. So when you're in your meditations and you're trying to create something or manifest something in your life, don't look at it in three-dimensional. Move around it. Go around it. Go behind it. Go above it. Go beneath it. Train your mind. Train your subconscious to allow you to see it for what it really is as being holographic. They say, we have this te they say we have this ability to do it. You know, that they need technology to do it, but we don't. Because we have the benefit of having been at 11th density. You know, again, I don't know. Okay. Thanks, honey. Okay, I think we're officially ready now. First slide, please. Okay. That is a blurry white light. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a galaxy. This is, in fact, the Andromedan galaxy. Now, apparent, according to the Andromedans, and some of this I'm going to be repeating, underneath every galaxy is a black hole in which the consciousness came out of. They say that all of the suns inside a galaxy is a reflection of the consciousness of the beings that are in that galaxy. In other words, our sun is a reflection of us. Alcyon, which is the sun that our sun evolves around, is a reflection of not only us, but the Pleiadians, the Alcyons, Cirrus, a whole bunch of groups of beings. In other words, we literally create these suns, this reflection of light, so that we can play this game in physicality. It's the only way to do it. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a rendition of our galaxy. This is approximately where we are. Now, as you can see, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of light years across. We are literally in the sticks. We are way at the end here. <laughs> okay. And, you know, in, in, in one way, that's really been a blessing, because if we were a lot closer here, we would not have had the opportunities we've had to self-rule. Because, ladies and gentlemen, in the regressive hierarchies of extraterrestrial governments, there's no such thing as self-rule. You do as you're told, or you're gone. Okay. Now, self-rule is really an experiment that's only been in existence 215 years. That's it. We take for granted the freedoms that we have. And we shouldn't. We are truly blessed to have had this opportunity. And we've had a lot of help in trying to maintain self-rule. Next slide, please. This is our solar system. These are some of the suns and uh, other star systems that are close to us. There is life, physical life, and organic life in every one of these star systems. 
In fact, the Andromedans say that there is organic and biological life on seven planets and 15 moons in our own solar system. Some of it we can't pick up because of our technology. It just isn't advanced enough. But nonetheless, it's still there. Next slide, please. Okay, our particular solar system, this is what's left of, apparently, Moldek, the planet that destroyed itself. Again, our moon used to be one of the moons here, and then Phobos, which is one of the moons of Mars, was also here. Next slide, please. Oh, I just, let's go, can we go back to that one sec? I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. Um, the uh, Galileo, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. The Galileo, as you know, has moved into the orbit of Jupiter. Uh, I don't know how many of you are paying attention to this, um, but NASA has contradicted itself a few times. Number one, the pod that was supposed to go into the Jupiter atmosphere, it was supposed to burn up and implode on itself because of the pressure and the radiation coming from Jupiter. Remember reading that a couple days before? Okay. Well, the last report was, well, it's actually landed on the surface of Jupiter, and it's going to be sending information for a couple weeks until it burns up. Okay? Major contradiction there. It went from, from burning up in, in entry to now sending information from the surface. Well, what surface? <coughs> okay. Um, also, the remaining portion that's orbiting the planet itself, its major functions is to keep an eye on the moon Ganymede. That's very significant. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the typical picture we see of our Earth. Okay, we are truly blessed to have a planet like this. And we are, each of us, truly blessed to have the ability to create such a place as this. If the Andromedans are right, and we created this world so that we could play this game, then it is a direct reflection of us. And the Earth is sick because maybe we're sick. And we're sick because maybe she's sick. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a photograph that was published in Life magazine. I have it right here. November 10th, 1967. This is the first color photograph of the Earth that was taken. Now, Life magazine almost was served with cease and desist papers for showing, for publishing this photograph. Does anybody have any idea why? <clears throat> you can speak up, it's okay. I can't hear anybody. The pole. Okay, we're talking about this here. Do you see the egress at the very top of the planet? It's flat, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's flat. It really is flat. <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's another picture of it. This was published by NASA. NASA uh, again, in 1967. <clears throat> now, a lot of this snuck through the cracks because NASA at that time was still very much civilian, and they were trying to create a lot of hype so that they would get the funding they wanted for the moon missions. Um, so a lot of these snuck through, and once they're out, they can't come back. You know, it's out there. So this is a book. This is published... Uh, by NASA in a book that involves a lot of the lunar orbiter photographs, primarily those of the far, the far side, the hidden side. Next slide, please. Now, this was taken by SS7 in, um, in gen on January 6th of 1966. Now, if you look at this photograph, this is of the North Pole. Why is this all blacked out? It's definitely blacked out. I'm going to show you why in the next picture. Next slide, please. This picture was taken by a NASA satellite. It hasn't been identified. It was released in England 
in a book called Our Violent Universe by Nigel Calder. I want you all to focus right here. If you can find the book, usually in a used bookstore, it clearly shows the opening and the clouds dipping inside. Let's see if the next slide's a little better. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, if you can get the book, I'm going to make some pictures of this um, for Pat. And if he wants to continue to make them, you know, you'll have to talk to him about it. I'm volunteering you, Pat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's there. It is just flat out there. This is where Admiral Byrd apparently went in. You know, this is it. This is the deal right there. This is just north of Greenland, which is exactly where he said he went. Okay. Here, this is our home. This is our home, and we still know so little about it. We have got to stop being sheeple. Next slide. This is the lunar orbiter. This is the photographer of the pictures some, you, that you're going to see. Next slide. Now, uh, the lunar orbiter um, flew. That's okay. <laughs> the lunar orbiter um, flew from uh, from 1965, 66, and 67. Its purpose was to chart and map locations for possible lunar landings. Next slide. Okay, here's our moon. We're told a lot of things about our moon. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion that a lot of the NASA photographs were faked, and uh, some of them were, in fact, faked. They were done in the studio, but, but ladies and gentlemen, our astronauts did, in fact, go to the moon. Um, they did go, but they were told not to come back. Next slide. Um, you know, we didn't have all the super secret, the civilian portion of NASA did not have all the super secret technology that was given to it by ETs. That was held by a very select few. So what we did accomplish as a nation going there and putting, you know, all these men on the moon is a remarkable achievement in our short history as a nation of only 200 years. Remarkable. What's really sad is that apparently, according to Morinet, by March of 1958, we were already on the moon. NSA astronauts were already there. But we cannot congratulate them or applaud them or have a parade for them because of the way they did it. But we can be proud of the fact that we put these guys here, and we did it honestly. You know, even even though it was the lunar orbiter was a little crackerjack box. <coughs> Next slide, please. Okay, there's a lot of uh, talk about what the astronauts saw. Um, they did, in fact, see stuff. There were there's all kinds of things that they saw, and um, just don't be so quick to dismiss it. Next slide. National Geographic. 1958. This is NASA's rendition of what the lunar bases would look like when, in fact, we did colonize the moon. This is, in fact, a reality already. Next slide, please. Domes. This is how they would terraform probably parts of the moon. Or this is exactly what it was before when it came here from Ursa Minor. Huge domes with terraforming going on on the inside creating artificial atmospheres and in habitats, just like what was created in Arizona. We have this technology. We have this technology. We've had it since the early 1960s to do this. Next slide. Okay, far side of the moon, 15 degrees south. I want you to look at the squareness. Look at the pointed top here. Obviously been bombarded. Next slide. Look at the structures in here. Look at all this. Okay, this is what's left of a pyramid. Next slide. 
Again, this is the far side. All these pictures are the far side. I want you to pay close attention to this area right here. Okay? Now, does everybody see this? I'm sorry, I'm in the way. This right here. You see this? According to Moore and A, this, this structure is a monument. It is seven miles tall. That is the Sears Tower seven times. Now, how is it that our guys missed that? <coughs> Next slide. Here's a close-up of it. Now these are lunar these are lunar photographs, lunar orbiter photographs that were taken that I've got out of a book in the Carlsbad Library. I blew them up at Kinko's and then we photographed them. Okay, I'm told we can't get the actual negatives to this anymore. I think that's the best it is. Um, Seven miles. Now, if you look at the rest of the train, um, can we go back this one? If you look at the rest of the terrain here, it's obviously very odd, isn't it? And some of the researchers that say that all of the moon has been bombarded by incessant meteorite bombardment, how is it that this has maintained its form? Next slide. Okay. And again. Okay. I hope you can see this one. Some of these are difficult. I want you to focus on this area right here, this crater. Now, can any of you see this structure here that totally crosses the crater? Can you see that? <coughs> Do you see it? It's an arch. Okay. According to NASA, this is called, this crater is given a numerical order 1164A. They don't even give it a name. And according to them, it's 21 miles across. So this arch, and you can see the sun coming through here, this arch is 21 miles long. Now, that's an incredible architecture, architectural achievement. I'm open to the idea that a comet hit it just right, skipped underneath, and came out the other end. <clears throat> but it's a hard sell. <clears throat> Again, this is on the far side. How is it we haven't heard about this? How did they miss this? They got a picture of it. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, on this particular slide, there's two things. I want you all to focus on this area right here, primarily these structures, and also just look at the sharp edges on this crater here. <clears throat> Next slide. Right here. Look at this. Doesn't this look like airline, airplane hangars? Huh? At a base? Look at the edges on this crater. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, we are gonna focus on this picture here. We're gonna focus on this area right there. I want you to look at the rest of the terrain. Look at how different this area is right here. Look at how nice and lined up all of these objects are. Look at these structures right here and behind it. Okay, I want you all to focus on that for a minute or just for a few more seconds before we get to, it got blurry, before we go to the next shot. It, it takes some time to actually accustom, to, to accustom your eyes to looking at things differently. Okay, next slide please. This is a blow-up of it. That arrow's mine, I'm sorry. Okay, here, look at this. Look at this in here. According to Morinet, this is one of the New World Order bases on the far side of the moon. He says that these here, behind here, these are living quarters. He 
He also says that this area has got trees, that you can walk outside without a spacesuit, that there's an atmosphere here in this whole large area of the moon, artificially been created. I don't know. I haven't been there. I'm just sharing with you what he's told me. Next slide. If you know anybody who can get or still has in the attic or, or somewhere in a file folder some of these old photographs and they were released, please get your hands on them and get yourself a loop and really, really look at them. There is so much. This area here, three-sided pyramid built inside of a crater. We'll go to the next slide, please. Here's a close-up of it. Next slide. <clears throat> square crater. Now I asked Morinet about the odds of a square meteorite or comet. He says there isn't any. It's so it's so obscure. The idea of a square meteor. Next slide, please. Okay. This area here, we are told that many of the meteorites. Our uh, craters were created by meteorite impactment. Um, what's interesting is that they try to tell us that it got so hot that it would cause a little cone in the middle of debris. Well, this is not really a cone, and this is actually higher than most of the rest of the crater. And what is this? You know, what would cause this? But there's, there's, there's more. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a close-up of it. Now, how many of you are familiar with Richard Hogan's work? Great. You know how he shows in his pictures what's left of the domes, you know, and how they used to glow? They had glass on them, and they were bombarded, okay, by meteor incessant meteorite bombardment? Look at this. Focus on this right here. See how it's shiny right here on the top and all the rest of it's been worn away? Next slide, please. Oops. <laughs> okay, hold on. I have to adjust this. Bear with me. Sorry, camera guys. Okay, cool. Okay, I want you to focus on this area right here. Okay, this particular crater. I want you very carefully to look at this structure here, right here, this bridge. I want you to pay very close attention to the, how it, the very bottom of the crater is lit up. Campfire? <coughs> Next slide, please. Here, look at this. I just love this photograph. This is the goods right here. Okay, <laughs> look at this. What is this? This is a structure. He said this is a building. These in here are domes at the bottom of the crater. He says that this is a row that leads to a tunnel and there's an elevator. When the craft land here, they walk into this structure, take an elevator down, and they walk into here. These bridges are what's left of other structures. Look at this. Just, just... <sighs> God, I hate being lied to. Yeah, I, it's, it, it, there it is. You know that song, Duh, there it is? There it is. I mean, it's, it's there. Oh, that's even better. Up in here? Oh, up, up here? Over this. Right on the right on the edge, at the left, about two thirds from the bottom. Talking about over here? Yeah. Well, let's let's find out. I'm open. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. You know, Pat is going to have these. Okay, you'll have to work out the details with him, but folks, you know, these are yours. 
You're free to do whatever you want with them. Just do something with them. Okay? Just do something. Because we're, we've been lied to. You know, and they're about to really box us in, and it just isn't fair. Next slide, please. Okay. Again, far side of the moon. I want you all to focus right here on this crater here. Okay? More so on this structure. Next slide, please. Okay, I just love this. <laughs> okay, look at this. That's right, and you can see that it's actually off the ground. Okay. Also want you to focus on this structure here. You can see the sunlight underneath it. Next slide. <clears throat> It's a ship. It's a ship. Clear as day. I'm sorry we, the lunar couldn't read the uh, numbers on it, but <clears throat> now this crater is, is uh, this crater is supposed to be 14 miles. If you look at the idea that it's 14 miles, now these, this particular photograph was taken from 86,000 feet. Um, you know this is this is several miles long. That's, that's a fairly large craft, I'd say, when the shuttle's allegedly the best we have. Next slide. Okay, in this photograph, Mornay insisted I put this one in because this whole structure here used to be covered by a dome. And this area in here was destroyed, he told me, by particle beam weapons that belonged to the Pleiadians. That's all he'd tell me. And if you looked at the rest of the craters that we were looking at, this is very, very unusual. In fact, you can see what looks like a, like a road or a platform road that comes into the middle of all of this. <clears throat> and I realize some of this might be hard for some folks to see. I'm, you know, I'm just trying to share. Next slide, please. Okay, Mars. Um, <laughs> You know, during Bush's administration, they were talking about our new home. <laughs> what they didn't tell you is we'd already been there for a long time. You know, that you'd already paid to build a home there. Next slide. Okay, most of us know about the face. Again, they say that this is the face of an Orion king. He won't tell me who, but that it's a tomb. That these are tombs. Next slide. Olympus Mons, allegedly the largest volcano in our solar system. Um, these are clouds. This is not frost. Uh, Mars has quite the atmosphere. There's quite a bit of moisture there, and as I told you earlier, um, they said that we had, uh, that they had, in 1971, they knew there was ozone there already. Next slide. Now, by the way, as you know, a volcano um, once it's become dormant, it leaves huge underground caverns underneath it when the lava subsides. That means there's huge underground caverns, especially a, a volcano that's 72,000 feet. Now, the face on Mars is that Richard Hoagland and many other people are talking about is in the northern hemisphere called Cydonia. Morinet told me that there were more ruins in the southern hemisphere. This is our great plantation. And uh, what I want you to do is I want you to focus on this area right here. Primarily this area and this area. And the happy face. <laughs> Next slide, please. Here's the blow up of it. <coughs> Again, it looks like a, uh, half of a face. There's the helmet, partial of the face. He said this was destroyed, and here's three pyramids. One, two, three. So there's more than there's more than one. Next slide, please. This is the geometric work. Um, that uh, Hoagland and others have done about the mathematical 
alignment of everything's there. I'm, I'm not a scientist, you know. I, I, I tend to lead more towards the, the esoteric end of it than the actual physical end of it. Um, but anyway, it's there. There's no question that it's there, and it's no question that it's an accident, or that it's not an accident. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, for the People newsletter, um, had a picture. This picture has been circulated. It was actually in several magazines. It has been analyzed, and um, it is apparently a real extraterrestrial. Um, along the skin, there are small microscopic hairs, um, and everyone is convinced that it is, in fact, a real extraterrestrial. Now, Coca-Cola used this in an ad, and so did um, Lockheed. Very subtle. They just put it out there, so when you say, why didn't you tell us, they can turn around and say, well, we did. You didn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Which lady mean they was that? That is a gray. That's an Orion gray. <laughs> this is a, a, a clone gray with a big head, the dark <laughs> eyes. Okay, they're clones. They don't have a soul inside of them. Next slide, please. This is the one that's doing most of the abductions, by the way, doing the genetic experiments. Next slide. <coughs> Artist rendition of, the, of, of Roswell. Next slide. Artist rendition of Aztec. Now, folks, for the record, according to Morinay, the Aztec crash was a lot more profound than was the Roswell crash. They, ha they both occurred in New Mexico. Next slide. I'm sorry? That's a military vehicle. Next slide. Please. This is my rendition based on the holograph that I was shown of an Alpha Draconid. This particular entity was 22 feet tall. They created it holographically for me. Scared the crap out of me. I kid you not. This is what it looks like. And it, what's really weird is they had oriental eyes. Very oriental eyes. Two rows of teeth and a steel plate on the very top of their head. Uh, their horns. Their horns. Their horns. Yeah, scaly, skin. scaly skin. Is everybody getting the picture here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Hybrid. Uh, again, this is an artist's rendition. Um, they're different. They're different. Um, they have no emotional body um, because they have no soul. And I kind of feel bad for the greys in one respect. Um, but you know, they could have gone about this a totally different way. They made their choices. Next slide. And that's it. You just need to light us. We'll do, I'll do it for you later. <laughs> Here's the uh, Life magazine, November 10th, 1967. You go to the back, and it's like, uh, here's the page, here's the photograph. <clears throat> okay, that shows the egress at the top of the planet. It's the very top, see where it's flat? And, of course, we all know about the ancient legends. You can't go, you, if you sail so far into the ocean, you'll fall off the edge, and there's terrible, terrible monsters there. Okay? <clears throat> monsters being probably some dinosaurs.
That's correct. And the draconian races. That's right. Okay, we're officially doing questions now. This is the part I like. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could stand up if you want to ask a question because, you know, give me a hard time about stuff. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, my first question is, you mentioned that um, there were some humans that were put on another planet that the Andromedans saw. Yes. I'd like to know, how can we protect ourselves from that happening to some of us? By our free will or that we don't allow that? I don't have that answer. I wish I did. Oh, okay. Um, Uh, myself and I know several others have always felt like we've always wondered why we were here at this time. Uh, some of us aren't fully conscious or aware of why we are here. So um, do you suppose the answer in that lies and maybe we had been uh, some of the ET Atlanteans that are having to pay back or, or we're here to watch or help or? That's a great question. I've been told that some of us have been here a long time evolving, learning not to withhold love. I've also been told that some of us, and I don't know who, some of us have come back in time from the future to this time right now, or whenever we were born, to right a terrible wrong. And that's all I know, to right a terrible wrong. If you could get somebody else to ask a question. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to correlate information that you put out and that <clears throat> we've heard it, uh, elsewhere. You use the word den uh, density. Does this equate to dimension? Yes, sir. They're one and the same. Okay. And then what about the um, septenary <laughs> concept of this, our planetary system as espoused by... Um, uh, the Theosophical, Alice Bailey information of um, the different seven planes. Um, are those densities or, or dimensions in the sense that you use it? Um, sir, I don't, I don't know exactly what Alice Bailey talks about well, the seven the, planes. You've I, got the physical, emotional, mental, intuitional, the spiritual. Oh, you're talking about the levels of the, of the, of the energy field? Yes. Uh, I understand there's eight. Eight. And that equates to the word uh, density? Um, no, sir. My understanding is that it's a holographic imprint of all that we are totaled, um, focused into one intent, which is the physicality that we are in right now. In other words, there's eight levels of you, as I understand it, eight levels of me. I'll use myself as an example. There are eight levels of me that have their focused intent on creating this physical reality right now. Me right here talking to you holding this pen. Now we're all multi-dimensional, but apparently it takes eight levels of me to create me being here and holding this intent, this form together, holding this pen, talking to you. At this density? Yes, sir. All right. You had asked me to repeat uh, something we were talking about in the hall. Yes, sir. I um, had spoken with Alex in the hall and mentioned that uh, several years back I was told by a friend of mine who worked most of his adult life in the CIA that his brother who had retired as a director of operations from NASA had told him that the meeting, if you'll remember, I think it was in 1990, between uh, George Bush and Gorbachev on a boat off the uh, shores of Malta, which was a very secure location, 
was solely for the discussion of the object in orbit around Mars, and the comment by this man was that both governments are just scared to death. And uh, I think that was around 1990 that they had that, which would correlate with the 1989 uh, takeover that you mentioned on, on your tape. Of Mars. There was one other thing we were talking about. Do you remember what it was? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like a lifetime ago. Well, I'll think uh, about it in a little bit. Um, I was told in 1989 that... Oh, how do I put this? Um... What happened was, we were given technology, and apparently we were allowed to colonize the moon and Mars. And the best and the brightest and the finest technology that we could create was taken to Mars. Um, and some of our strongest genetic human beings on our planet were also taken there to start another colony. Um, once that happened, in 1989, apparently the Draconans reneged the deal and actually invaded Mars and have virtually destroyed the colony that we had there. Now, I was told this occurred in March of 1989. I believe it was March of 89. Um, along with that, our government was told to totally trash our environment, to bring the people to its knees. Now, other people have heard other things. And that they were given a promise by the Greys that they would use their technology to help clean up the environment once we had extinguished self-rule on the planet. Key word here, self-rule. According to Moranay, the, uh, the Greys have absolutely no intention of keeping that promise. None whatsoever. So the bottom line here is, folks, it is we, the people, that need to stand up and take over the leadership roles on our planet. And I don't know how we're going to do it, but one thing's for sure, if we do it together, we will succeed. You know, we got to put our penny ante little garbage aside for a minute and look at our priorities. And what are our priorities? It's our environment. It's each other, and it's our kids. You know, we just have to do this. Somehow we have to do this. Are there any more questions? Yes, sir, in the back. I'd like to know if the Andromedans are going to help us, and if they are, when they plan on uh, doing this, and will they inform everybody somehow that uh, all these problems are going on so that we might unite in... Uh, you know, more uniform effort to uh, overcome the problems that we have. Um, actually, they've, they've actually made that decision by, by telling um, all of the ET races, and I understand that many of the crop circles are actually um, from the Andromedan Council telling them of the deadline of August 12, 2003 to be out of here. So they have obviously made a decision to interfere um, if it's going to be any sooner, as far as them completely interacting with all of us on a mass level, um, I'm told that it's going to require 10% of the population asking. They will not intervene unless 10% of the population asks voluntarily. This cannot be a mass hypnotic suggestion to ask. We each have to individually ask, and it has to be 10% of the population. And he said, by the time you finish your prayer, we'll be here. They want to help. They want to help. But they don't know how to help because we have free will. You know, they, if they come in and just intervene, then they violated our free will, and they are exactly at the same level as the Draconans, the Orions, and the Greys. And that's not a standard they live by. Next question, please. There's a half a million um, ETs here, and you also indicated that... Uh, no, I didn't say half a million. Well, that was on your tip, I thought. Uh, well, quite a few, let's say. Okay. Did, right. did they also tell you how then they're going to take them out of here? Well, no, I said, I said that when I, when I gave you the date of August 12th. I have no idea how they're going to carry that out. Okay. Um, but if they're in the Earth, I mean, here's the only possible scenario that I know. Okay, if they're in the Earth, I, I, the, moon, the moon would probably be an easier thing if those that are there. 
They can hit it with a tractor beam and pull it out of here. Right. Okay, but those that are in the earth... They don't bother me. Okay, those that are in the earth, the only way I know of to get them out would be to enter at the poles and force them out to the surface. <laughs> Which means it could get really weird. <laughs> it could get really weird when you have, you know, you, you see reptilians running across the highway, the interstate. <laughs> I mean, it could get really, really, really weird. Uh, you also mentioned in the tape on the next 10 years that it is going to get pretty weird. Correct. And uh, <laughs> is, this, yeah. is this part of the weirdness you, you're thinking, or what are the weird things you think? Because you said that uh, they got themselves in such a jam now that they lost Mars. And the moon doesn't seem to be too good a place to go because if they pull them out with that tractor beam from Jupiter, then they're stuck here with us. Right. The moon apparently was just a, a jumping point to colonize Mars. Because of its, its atmosphere, or lack of atmosphere per se, um, long-term habitation cannot exist on our moon, which is why they had to go to Mars. Um, but yes, they've lost it, and the world leaders and everybody who's cut all these deals now find themselves in a real problem. They have nowhere to hide. They can't just skip out of here. Now, mm -hmm. to counter that, <laughs> the fact that they can't skip out of here, what they've done is they're now using the United Nations, and this is information that I've given to Pat, um, regarding the Global Biosphere Program. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, you will definitely have that information today. I don't know if it was passed out uh, tonight or not. Um, oh, God. The United Nations wants to create reserves, biosphere reserves. And the place that they are focusing most of their attention is the United States. The reason? 78% of all the fresh water left on the planet is in North America, Canada, and the U.S. Okay? You control the water, you control the food. Control the food, you control the people. You control the people, you're a king. It's that simple. Now, September of this year, Bill Clinton gave 18 million acres of Yellowstone National Park to the United Nations Biosphere Program. It is no longer part of the United States. And all you got to do is pick up the phone tomorrow morning and call the ranger station at Yellowstone National Park and say, is this a UN Global Biosphere Reserve? And just listen to the response you get. It's no longer ours, folks. Yosemite, Rocky Mountain National Park have both been nominated. That's the word they're using, nominated. And the, he's just giving it away. It's actually their money. We were just renting it. <laughs> We were just renting our own currency. But that's a whole other issue, and I don't want to... Okay, uh, we will have that information for you tomorrow, at least part of the handout uh, regarding that, and who to get hold of, and how to contact um, everybody with this information. Um, it's an absolute necessity. They're going to literally take the land from right out underneath us. Now, what's also interesting is that in this plan, parts of these biosphere uh, programs, uh, reserves... There's certain areas that are going to have, have absolutely no human use. That means you are not allowed in them at all. And around them, there are 40 to 50 to 150 mile buffer zones. That means that if you look at Yellowstone, they are now drawing up plans based on this information to remove everybody within 50 miles of that area. Whether you own the land or not, it's, you're gone. You're going to have to move. These people? Nobody's really said. Um, supposedly it's um, so the wolves can come back and the grizzly bears can come back. You know, um, you know if, you look at, if you look at 100 wolves, they need approximately 22 million acres of roaming territory. That's, that's Connecticut, Rhode Island, and half of New York and New Hampshire. You know, what are you going to do with all those people just so that 100 wolves can live there? I mean I, I mean, I love nature, you know, but there's another way to doing this. And they want to just take the land away from us. Anyway, this is actually already happening, happening, and we will have that information for you tomorrow. Do we actually have it now? 
Uh, it didn't copy machine. Okay. We'll have it for you tomorrow. <clears throat> no, um, apparently it wasn't, uh, but this has been something that has cropped up really in the last uh, five or six years. And the leading proponent of this is Nature's Conserv Conservancy. They're the leading proponent. What they're doing is they're going in and buying the land, holding it for a few years, and then turning around and selling it to the United States government, who in turn is giving it to the United Nations. And it's no longer part of the United States now. <clears throat> uh, Clinton gave it to them, is what the report says. Gave it to them. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Yes, sir. You're talking about something a little bit more that I'm familiar with. Uh, last year or two years ago, they had a, tri um, a convention in Rio de Janeiro to talk about the principles that would be put into effect with the Biodiversity Treaty. And there was a couple of lobbyist groups that raised attention in uh, the Senate, and it was stopped. It was not ratified. But the government's implementing these principles anyway. And there was a speech done here in um, Lubbock, Texas, for the East Texas Environmental Plan, which is doing exactly what you described. In fact, they'll be using non-government organizations to fight the fact that the treaty was not ratified, so yep. they don't have any authority to do what they're doing legally, so they're going to have to do it. They know that they're going to get into a legal battle, and the money <coughs> is being drawn with uh, out of our treasury or out of our reserves, given to non-government organizations to fight the municipalities that will resist. They'll give up, and, set, and this will set the precedent, since they don't have a treaty authorizing it. I, I'll bring a copy of that speech tomorrow. That'd be great. So this is really dangerous. You know, I mean, th you know, their goal in the next five years is that the United States of America, as we know it, is going to cease to exist. You know, and they're just going to put us all to sleep. Oh, yes, ma'am. I would like to get off of this for a moment, and I'd okay. like to ask you, if you know what happens to us, the spiritual us, the spirit that leaves the body, when that we leave this body behind. Where do we go? Anything else, anything else you've got? Um, this is going to stretch your belief systems. No, it won't. <laughs> I want you to look at the idea that when we cross over and... Uh, Oh, God. Um, when we cross over and we all see the light, and we walk into the light, and we meet our past loved ones, etc., my understanding is that that place, in, if it were a physical place, would be where the Van Allen belt is. And we go there, and we are processed there, and, we, and in the processing, part of it is us looking back at our lifetime. And in that looking back at that lifetime, we look back at the places in our life where we withhold love. And then we come back to balance those places where we withheld love. And until we get that right, um, we go over and over, the broken record, over and over and over. <clears throat> But if it, if it was a physical location, <laughs> it would be where the Van Allen belt is. I understand. Thank you. Are yes, ma'am. Are you familiar with Dr. Walter Russell? No, ma'am. He's I'm not. no longer in this life plan, but he's a very good teacher on all those subjects. And he, you know, he explains what happens to us after. Actually, life and death is one cycle. Yes, ma'am. And he explains all this and what happens to us, that we're just recycled, so to speak, yeah, we're re to learn what we haven't learned in this life. In fact, education is the main point right. of what we're supposed to be doing. But you know what? If they didn't screw with the religions and they were telling us the truth, we wouldn't have to do all this recycling. You know, we'd have learned this lesson a long time ago. We're smart. You know, we've just been messed with. If they would stop messing with us, we'd probably start graduating a lot more of us. 
you know, checking out of here and going out other places and, and teaching what we know, or even going home, wherever that is, you know? Yes, sir. The other item we were talking about, I recalled, was <laughs> thank you. <laughs> was a newspaper article that I read probably eight or ten years ago. It was a full page spread, and it was about the Space University, which was being hosted by MIT. And the idea was that from year to year it would be at different universities around the around the world. And it had probably a half dozen photographs of people from all over the world who were scientists participating in this effort. And I remember one Russian student was trying on an American spacesuit, and the idea was that all of these scientists would know each other and be able to pick up the telephone and call someone anywhere in the world to solve a problem. Well, I thought that was a great idea, so I fired off a letter to the director of Space University, hosted at MIT, and my letter came back unopened, and it said, moved, left no forwarding address. Coincidentally, at that period of time, which was late summer of that year, Mars was the closest that it had been to the Earth in four years. <laughs> oh, God. I said to somebody during the break, this is, we are living the ultimate soap opera. Yes, sir. Could you further explain um, what the Andromedans said about holographic projection? with their own minds. They say that we record everything, all of our experiences. Um, when, when your eyes are looking at me right now, that your brain is recording everything that's gone on here today holographically. And holographically is not necessarily third dimension. I cannot draw a holograph for you. Um, but essentially, it is five to nine parts of the image that you're seeing here, your brain is recording it, not only just what you see of me physically, but you, it, your brain is also recording my energy field, the thoughts that are in my aura, my energy field, it can see, you know, like mine can see yours on a subconscious level, but consciously I can't, I mean, on a subconscious level it's recording it, but consciously I can't see that. Um, but the mind is recording all of that all the time. And they say that we have the ability to recall that and, and be able to tap into it. I haven't learned how to do that. Um, I will tell you that I'm, 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 I've been experimenting a lot with telepathy. And the easiest way to do that is to start with your, your household animals, your pets. You know, I'm, I've got our cat down pat, <laughs> you know. <laughs> In fact, you know, we're so in tune with each other that if I think about the door, if I even hold it in my mind, he goes and hides under the bed because he knows I'm going to put him out, you know. Um, but just practice on, on your, your, your animals because they talk to each other telepathically, okay? When you have communication with yourself or when you're thinking about somebody and they call, that is telepathic communication. You are having it. You have, the more you honor it and acknowledge it, the stronger your subconscious will kick it out and allow you to tap into it. But if you say, oh, it was just a coincidence and you go into denial, it shuts down. It shuts down. So, you know, if everything is a belief system, everything you tell yourself will manifest, the good and the bad. It all starts here. Um, Mornay made reference to the fact that the whole universe is changing because thought is changing. So they're synonymous. They're one and they're one and the same. Any more questions? Oh, this has a gal in the back. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Put us sit down. Want to hear a joke? <coughs> it's a young man is um, walking with his son through a Midwest town, and there's an old cemetery at the edge of town, and they walk in there, and the and the the father's reading the the tombstones to his young son. So they get to the very last row, and there's a, a really odd-looking one, and the little boy says, Daddy, what does that say? And the, the father says, Well, here lies James Johnston, born 1801, died 1899. And the little boy looks at his dad and says, Well, Daddy, what does it say there at the bottom? So the father gets down on one knee, and he brushes the dead flowers and grass away, and, and he you know leans back, and he says, Well, it says, Here lies an, a politician and an honest man. 
So the little boy says, well, Daddy, what does that mean? And the father turns to his son and says, well, it means there's two bodies in this one grave. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, in reference to the holographic camera that you spoke of earlier that could heal ourselves, I'm wondering, is that um, only, can that only access this incarnation or can it go further back? It can go further back. Could it not take a picture of our, our DNA prior to its removal? Yes. Oh, that, that's what I was just wondering. Which we, we, which we absolutely have recorded within our energy field. Everything we've ever been is recorded there. Read between the lines, please. Yes, sir. A martial arts instructor that had a copy of a patent from the U.S. Patent Office. And when I went through it, what it was was it had something to do with uh, every object emanates some kind of radio wave. And the experiment was they made this device that can actually measure what its frequency is. And one experiment that they did is they took a photograph of a cornfield or of a field that had chinch bugs in it. And they then took this photograph and they put on the photograph um, DDT. Then they took this device and measured the photograph with the DDT <coughs> and everything else in the photograph and, and put it through an amplifier and played it back into the field and it killed all the chinch bugs in the field. <laughs> I love that stuff. That's great. I'm not surprised. You know, there's so much technology that's been withheld from us. You know, little tidbits, uh, uh, you know, cancer. There were cures for cancer in the 30s. Oh, let me tell you about that. According to Morinet, the cancer gene, or what kicks the body into manufacturing cancer, um, there is a part of it that is, in fact, genetic. And he said, Morinet has said, that when our physical bodies were created, they put in certain genes to make the bodies grow faster. Well, what happened was when they stripped us of, our, of the 10 DNA, some of the genes that they should have taken out, they left in because they were in a hurry. And that's why we have the cancer gene inside of us. It's because they didn't remove it when they took the other 10 strands out. So something in us kicks it into gear, which makes it start to manifest. But the vibration of love can cure that. And I don't know if, well, that's what they said. Yes, sir. Do you have any information on an intervention that may have occurred in 1972 when there was supposed to have been a large burst of solar energy that would have destroyed the life on the planet? Oh, yeah. Um, um, yes, uh, I've... I've People have approached me with that, and I've had the opportunity to ask Mornay and Viseas about that. And I've also heard that it's been said that in order to protect us from that burst of energy, that our solar system was put inside of a holograph. He says it isn't true. He laughed, as a matter of fact, um, when I asked him about that. And uh, it was also said to me that they were going to move our solar system within this holographic bubble closer to the dog, to the dog star Cirrus. And Morinay just said, impossibility. It cannot be done. So the bottom line is, we're stuck. We're going to have to take responsibility. We're going to have to do it ourselves. So that's all I know. A um, couple more questions, and I don't want to go through um, some things that are going to be going on the next 10 years. And, uh, and then we'll finish up, and then we'll resume tomorrow. Um, yes, ma'am. OK. OK, up, up next. I'm wondering, um, as all of us become more aware and focus our attention on light and love, and that is a collective source of energy, and won't that connect with the higher forces that are light and love and that are waiting to work with us? Yes, I believe so, and um, well, we're already connected. The thing that they're really looking for is our intention. If you could stop before you slap the dog or uh, uh, 
whatever decisions you make in your life, take a second and ask yourself, what is my intention behind this decision? That's what they're looking for is our intention. Intent is what created this mess. We have to take responsibility. So many of us are making decisions. We're just responding to past stimuli. We're not stopping to say, what is my intent for making this decision right now to do this or to do that? You know, and, and matching the intent with our gut instinct. If you have a gut instinct to not do something, to not go somewhere, don't do it. And honor it. Honor yourself. You know, these changes that are coming... The frequency changes. The Andromedan perspective is those that are going to be affected the most here on our world are the men. They say that the men, a lot of the men in our world are going to be leaving, transitioning, and that the obituary pages are going to be 10, 15 pages long in a newspaper, that the men are going to check out. And the reason he says they're going to be checked out is because they're full of self-imposed loneliness. They have shut themselves down, and they're shut down. And if they don't allow energy to move through their bodies, like women do, because of your extreme of emotions, a lot of men aren't going to make it. They will have brain aneurysms and heart attacks, and they'll be leaving left and right. They don't understand why the men, in our, men of our world are full of self-imposed loneliness. It's like we're carrying this guilt. You know, and I don't know if it's because religion says we were bad or what. I, mean, I just don't know. I really don't have a clue. But that's their perspective of the men of our world. You know, and if you're not in a space of love, you're in a space of fear. Yes, sir. Technology question. <laughs> Not my strength. Well, <laughs> did the Andromedans ever use or mention a form of energy called scalar electromagnetics? No. Not to my knowledge. The only form of energy that I know that they use is uh, um, holograph and hydrogen. How about has there ever been any talk about a blue star? Yes. The only one that's coming? Yes. Okay. How many of you are familiar with Hale Bob? The comet that's coming. Well, according to Morinet, it is not a comet. It is a protocol ship from Orion. It has at least four spiral structures on it. It is carrying two moons behind it. it has an atmosphere of at least 2.4 million miles. And when it enters our solar system, it is going to go around behind the sun. The two pods or two moons behind it are going to move into an orbit of Mercury and our government's going to make a public announcement. They're here, okay? They are not here to help us. They're here to make sure that control is maintained. When did that do? Uh, February and March of 97. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, you better look into it because this comet has changed course three times. And comets don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. You know, uh, somebody at NASA, when they were asked about that, said, well, it was the gravitational pull of planets. And thank God a reporter was smart enough to say, well, what planets? <laughs> you know, and it ended right there. The discussion ended right there. <clears throat> so that, you know, that dog doesn't hunt. So, you know, change is coming, folks. Change is absolutely coming. And... Uh, if you're not ready for it, then you better get ready for it. And if you are ready for it, get even more ready for it. You know, tell your friends, even if they don't want to hear it, even if they think you're crazy, just say something bizarre and crack the shell of denial. Just put a crack in there. And when they start hearing these little bits of pieces or these little rumors, they will remember and they will come back to you and start asking you about it. You know, um, oh, God, uh, <laughs> we're running out of time. You know, we're really running out of time, and, and, and we, can, we can do this. We really can do this. And we can do it ourselves so that we can be proud of ourselves that we did it. And we didn't have to depend on somebody else to save us. That will really empower us to be better, who we really are. 
you know? And when it starts to hit the fan, when UN helicopters are flying over the U.S., don't turn on each other. It's exactly what they want. Do not turn on each other. We can kick their ass. We'll take two more questions and then I'm going to do something. Yes. Uh, in the tapes we were asked to listen to before this evening, and I'm clear you're not clear which ones those were. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Whatever. Uh, what <laughs> What I understood you to say, not what you said, but what I understood you to say, was that um, that evil was a function of our own beliefs. Do I have that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And if you go one further, that in fact matter is a function of our beliefs. That's correct. So everything is a belief system. So what is the intent behind what we believe? And I'll go back to what Moronet had said that I shared with you earlier. It is not so much why you believe it, what you believe, as to why you believe it. So then, if you stand on those two things, and in fact, there, there is no matter, and there is no evil. Technically. Very, very high, I understand. Very high, I understand. Yeah. Right. Okay. Technically, that's correct. I just wanted to get that on record. But I'm not at that level. Right, I'm not either. <laughs> oh, one more question, and then I want to I want to share some things with you. Okay, I had two quick ones actually. <laughs> one and a half. All right. Uh, first, that comet allegedly that hit Jupiter. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you'd heard anything about that because when you look at it, just from primary physics, the way it broke up, as they told us is not the way it happens. In other words, all of those chunks were in a perfect line entering into Jupiter, and that's just not the way it happens. They would cluster. What was that? I don't know. Secondly, I see a parallel in a lot of belief systems, and I'm wondering if you have any information on whether it's part of the overall historical world programming. Basically, um, not to step on toes, but the New Age people think there's going to be this transition like you're talking about into another consciousness, and we'll leave all this trash behind. Uh, I see the same, th the same kind of a mechanism tailored for different belief systems, the, uh, the rapture in the Christian belief. Um, I see the... Um, a lot of the people who've studied a lot of the UFO uh, material thinking they're coming down to save us. And it goes on and on and on, four or five different versions of this depending on what consciousness that group of people has, happens to be in. And basically, to me, the message is just lie down and let the tanks roll over you. It is to deflect one away from this personal responsibility. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, sir, I do. Boy, do I do. <clears throat> Okay. Um, I once asked Phaseus, to give me a definition of our future. I asked him what our future was going to be. He said he couldn't tell me. It was all probabilities. I said, well, what can you tell me? He says, well, I can give you a definition. This is the definition of where we're supposed to be going, and he says we will, in fact, get there. Responsible freedom of self-determination, becoming truly self-confident and free to unconditionally be responsible for oneself without being coerced to accept some higher authority. Let me read that again. Becoming truly self-confident and free to unconditionally be responsible for oneself without be being coerced to accept some higher authority. What we're looking for, we already are. The miracles we're looking for, we already are. Uh, <clears throat> as far as Wanting to be saved, and I know this is a real touchy subject, 
you know and again everybody is allowed their space to believe what they want you know um, and if you want to be saved, hey, that's fine. But between now and the time you get, you do get saved or you don't get saved, you know, be responsible for yourself and teach your children to be responsible for themselves. Teach your neighbors to be responsible for themselves. We are supposed to become a race of leaders, not a race of sheep. We're supposed to be all chiefs and no Indians. That's what they teach their people. That's the law of consistency. Nobody falls behind. We e all evolve together. The children are supposed to be taught everything that we know and more. Nothing, nothing is to be withheld from children. They are to know everything because that's the next level of consistency. And we don't do that. I mean, I can't believe what they're teaching kids in school today. They're teaching them nothing. Nothing. You know, they can't solve any problems for themselves. You know, they're being taught what to think so they can spit, back, spit out facts like a computer. They're not being taught how to think for themselves, you know? And folks, we owe it to them to, to teach them how to do it. Somehow, some way. Schools are just babysitters now, that's all it is. In Andromeda, the, 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 the people that are held with the highest regard and esteem are in fact the teachers. It's not the politicians, it's not the millionaires, well they don't have a monetary system. It's the teachers, because they're the ones that affect all the future generations. They're it. They're the cream of the crop. Here, you know, they're, half of the teachers are starving. You know, they can barely buy a new car to get them to, get them to school. It's ridiculous. We're doing this thing half-ass backwards. We need to make changes, and it's going to have to be us to do it. It's just, it's going to have to be us whether it's homeschooling or whatever it's going to be, whether we just go to Washington and we fire everybody and we just start all over. You know, just start all over. <clears throat> just one more thought. Wait a minute, one more thought. As far as, as, far as the Savior scenario, um, all of that, I've been told, has been put into play into our belief systems to disempower us. Now... <laughs> This is touchy, so I'm just going to share with you what they've said. And I'm going to pick on the New Testament, and I apologize. Um, and again, I'm not uh, trying to offend anybody. I am sharing information that they have given me. This is their perspective. In the Old Testament, most of the Old Testament, particularly that of Genesis, is plagiarized versions of Chaldean texts that was done in 651 B.C. It was altered for the first time and changed. The being that we have been taught it through history as Moses was in fact two people. One of them's name was Moab, who was a Chaldean chief, and the other one was Prince Sesostris, who was a prince of Egypt, one of the families of Egypt. And what they did was they put the two together and created a composite character. So it isn't what it appears to be. When we get to the New Testament, hmm. uh, apparently the nine epistles of Paul were brought from Texala, India by one by the name of Apollonius of Tyana. Um, the four Gospels that we know of were obtained by Haraman Armandi of Taxala, India. They were Hindu in their original form by, again, Apollonius of Tyana, who is in fact one and the same as Paul the Apostle. Um, the being that we know as Jesus did in fact live. Um, he didn't, was in fact crucified um, through the palms, but he did not According to the Andromedans, he did not rise into the sky into heaven. He actually lived out the rest of his life and died at Masada in 64 AD when the Romans stormed it. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there. But that's what they say. Um, 
They also said that the last version of the Gospels and the Epistles were translated by Euphilius, who was a Catholic bishop, and that the original books in the original form are in the University of Upsal, and they are called the Codex Argentinus, and the original handwriting is in Sumerian. That's real old. So that's all I know. And that, again, that is their perspective. What about Adam and Eve? They were, it was a tribe. It was not two beings. They just, you know, basically gave us the Cliff Notes version of it. <laughs> <laughs> This will be the last question, and then I'm going to see um, I believe it is. Assuming, for example, that there were two Moseses. <laughs> um, no, there wasn't one. They took two, two, right, two and they just created a composite character. Characters composing a composite. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't deter from, to me, from what, uh, that the fact that he was tuned in enough to uh, guide and to lead others, mm -hmm. and that he was in the right place at the right time. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Doing. You're absolutely right. Now, where's the best place to hide a lie? Between two truths, right? You change it just enough that we can't put the pieces together. That we make a conscious choice. Now, remember, what I was saying earlier, this whole thing is about self-responsibility, self-rule, all right, and free will. Now they've altered the truth just enough that it's kept all of us holding back. We're all holding back, waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So here we are making the decision to hold ourselves back because we're waiting for somebody to come and save us. And it isn't going to happen. They say it just isn't going to happen. And they don't want to come in here and save us because they don't want to babysit. And if something happens, well, we can always blame them. And the cycle starts all over again. And we don't have time. The earth is sick. We don't have another home. We don't have, we have, there's nowhere to go. There's no Hilton big enough to put us all in. <clears throat> I know that's not the answer you want to hear. It's not the answer I want to hear. Because it means I have to really bust my ass to fix my, my life. Uh, but I don't have a choice. That's just the way it is. <laughs> I think they're going to ask you to repeat it. <laughs> But there is a saving reality. There is the, the truth that brings people a challenge to grow internally, to be able to keep up with evolution. In this sense, when the planet goes into fourth and fifth dimension, it puts right. a, a great responsibility upon us as individuals to get busy and do the work, which will, in a sense, save us from having to repeat uh, planetary experience elsewhere. Right. You're absolutely right. Now, let's just assume that Jesus is a reality, okay? He did say, These things I do, ye shall do greater, if ye have faith. Now, there's a profound message in that. These things I do, ye shall do greater, if ye have faith. There's a profound message there. Don't ignore it. Please don't ignore that. We, you are awesome. Every one of you, you're awesome. Don't buy what you've been told. It's a lie. You are awesome. Now, I want to share what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Actually, this started in 1994. I read this for the first time. So it's actually the next nine years. Scientific proof of dimensions and higher self-consciousness. Reincarnation will be scientifically proven and demonstrated. Now, that'll be interesting. <clears throat> you know, I can, I just, you know, I can wait. You know, 
everybody would start running to Buddhism. Oh, this is the way, this is the way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> this is the way. Uh, Acknowledgement of other life in the galaxy and universe and ample proof already exists on the moon, Mars, Earth, and Venus. Venus. Someday the Russians will actually come out and start telling us what they found there. Extraterrestrial contact from at least nine different races. Now we're talking 2004. Introduction of free, clean energy devices based on magnetic fields of energy. That the Earth is hollow and capable of sustaining life, and the existence of a city known as Kal Nigor, K A L N I G O R, within the hollow Earth that was originally built by Lyrans. Rediscovery of the lost lands of Atlantis and the Pacific and Antarctica. There's a lot underneath that ice, folks. And in the Pacific, a very large comp uh, temple complex that is still intact that belonged to Lemuria that is approximately 151 miles southwest of Easter Island. Now, the Russians already know it's there. And if they know, then you know we know. <clears throat> the reality that we all see in the physical is a holographic imprint directed and created from a higher portion of ourselves. That human consciousness is not in the brain, but located in its entirety in the energy field and aura. You know, when, when, a, when a body crosses over, it loses anywhere from, from a half an ounce to four ounces of weight. That's you, folks. That is really you. You know, that's you. This is just a suit. How our past and present educational processes have not prepared us to be completely conscious, creative thinkers. We definitely have to change that. That organic and plant life forms do exist on seven planets and 15 moons in our solar system. Another major revelation. Rediscovery that each of us is a part of the whole of the universe and that we are a significant part of that idea that we call God and that God is the idea called love. That this accelerating self-discovery being experienced was created and activated by all of us. And that we as a product of extraterrestrial genetic manipulations are possessors of a vast gene pool that has many different racial memory banks of at least 22 different races. Because of our genetic heritage and because of the fact that we are spirit the benevolent extraterrestrial races actually look at us as being royalty. They look at us as being royalty. Now well, that's the best kept secret in the solar system. <coughs> 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 at least on this planet anyway. They actually consider us royalty. All of us. Okay. Now, I would like to just end this uh, with a prayer. I'd like you, whatever questions you have tonight or tomorrow, for those of you who are coming back, please write them down. I would like to spend a lot of time on questions tomorrow if you want. But uh, what I'd like to do is to end this with a prayer. It's a Native American Indian prayer. Um, my wife and I are, are feel a very strong kinship with the Native Americans. Um, and as Chief Joseph said, it takes few words to speak the truth. And I have found that the Native American's way of putting things is direct, to the point, and simple. So I'm gonna, we're going to end this with this little prayer. So make yourself comfortable. Kind of loosen up and chill out. <clears throat> oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds, and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me. I am a man before you, one of your many children. I am small and weak. I need your strength to let my eyes ever see the red and purple sunsets. Make my hands respect the things that you have made, my ears sharp to hear your voice and the sounds of your wild children. Make me wise so that I may know the things that you have taught my people 
and the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and every rock. I seek strength, great spirit, not to be better than my brothers, but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me ever ready to come to you with clean hands and a straight eye, so that when life fades as a setting sun, my spirit may come to you without shame. Aho. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very, very much.